Uh, a lot of the members of the coalition are here, and I appreciate you all uh, for coming. I'm going to let Ed introduce the panel and what we're talking about today. What I would like to do real quick is introduce what the coalition is. And this coalition started, it literally started with the idea that if you limit people's ability to get a job only through background checks and fingerprinting, how it originally started, you were not only not helping, you're actually increasing crime because people uh, don't have the opportunity to feel like they're part of the community. And I work for a, cold, uh, you know, a conservative, a libertarian organization, and I'm always confused when people on the right wonder why people don't want to participate in the system when they have been disinherited from the American dream. And what is the American dream? The American dream is that you have the opportunity to provide for your family. You have the opportunity to progress. And I'm not saying that this is a coalition about criminal justice reform, because it's not. And there's great organizations out there that focus on criminal justice reform. Heritage, uh, American Protection Reform, the Koch Institute, and these are all organizations on the right. The ACLU, uh, CAP, these are all organizations that focus on criminal justice reform on the left and the right. And then there's coalitions, uh, Justice, Justice Action Network, and the Coalition for Public Safety. And that's not what this, or, this coalition is about. This coalition is about the dignity of work about the idea that if you want to progress in our society, that you should be able to, your sweat should be able to manifest itself into a, a progression. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ed, who is going to be moderating our, our panel, and introduce the panel and what we're going to be talking about today. So thank you very much. Hey everyone, my name is Ed Chun. I'm with the Center for American Progress. I do not work at R Street Institute. Um, but what was interesting was like I just started here at CAP. Um, I'm the Vice President for Criminal Justice Reform there. And I came out of the last administration's Justice Department and about three months ago started CAP. And one of the first people that I met um, a, a couple months ago was, was Arthur. And we had, we over dinner actually sat down and started talking about criminal justice issues. And just like a lot of other conversations, I know Jorge's here and some other people uh, in terms of left-right, uh, there was not only just things that we had in common or common ground, most every single thing that we talked about, our policies just aligned. And Arthur, I, I said this earlier to some people, but Arthur's act was actually a bit more progressive. Um, sorry. <laughs> Or small, small p progressive uh, than I was on some issues. Um, and so it, I think this is one of the topic areas that uh, we all look forward to in terms of discussing, talking about, and actually making significant policy reforms and changes over the next four years. Um, folks on my side of the aisle politically, uh, maybe uh, Depressed? This is this recording. Um, <laughs> and, and concerned uh, about some of the things that are happening, but when we look at what's happening in the states, and when we look at what's happening in local uh, places, uh, thanks to a, a few of the people on this panel, a lot of you, um, there is there's hope for a lot of good change and a lot of good progress for a lot of people to, uh, as Arthur's saying, to live the American dream. For those of you, uh, I mean, who are in this space, know all the stats, so I don't have to give you the whole. Well, you know, we're five percent of the world's population, but twenty-five percent, so forth. Six hundred fifty thousand people cycling in and out of jails every single day. Over two million people in prisons. Um, there's a lot of people coming back home after they have served their time. The question is no longer what, what should we do anything for them. It is what can we, what should we do for them? And I think you'll see a lot of alignment on this panel, a lot of different perspectives. I have the real privilege of introducing them. Uh, I also have the privilege of, uh, after a drink, reading bios. So forgive me if uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the best venue that I've ever been in for a panel, by the way. So, uh, thank you, Caroline. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excuse me for one second before we go on. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. <laughs> All right, so Arthur Reiser is the Justice Policy Director and Senior Fellow at the Art Street Institute. Uh, it's a think tank that promotes uh, limited, uh, effective government and free markets. Uh, Arthur it was a professor at West Virginia at Georgetown Law. Uh, he was previously a prosecutor, a trial attorney with the Justice Department, as well as a military police officer uh, where he served in Fallujah. Uh, and he retired as a lieutenant, commander, uh, excuse me, lieutenant colonel uh, from the West Virginia National Guard. 
Um, he also was a civilian police officer in Washington State. He's a prolific writer, having authored three books and numerous articles on a variety of topics, including immigration, national security, criminal justice, and constitutional law. If you just hold your applause, because I will be asking for your applause. Uh, Teresa Hodge is a passionate advocate for people with criminal uh, convictions and is committed to reducing the lasting harm caused by prison. Teresa served a prison sentence, a uh, federal prison sentence for a white collar offense that introduced her firsthand to the justice system and mass incarceration in America. Upon coming home, she and her daughter, Lauren, co-founded Mission Launch, incorporated a nonprofit focused on introducing technology and entrepreneurship to previously incarcerated individuals as a way of ensuring self-sufficiency. Additionally, she, uh, the organization manages the Rebuilding Reentry Coalition, a citizen-led movement committed to creating more just and inclusive society for returning citizens. She's a Soros Fellow, which will provide her uh, the opportunity to focus even more on justice involved individuals. Uh, next to Teresa is Marcus Bullock, a justice reform advocate, public speaker, and entrepreneur. Following his 2004 release from prison, he launched the painting company, is now CEO of Perspective Premier Contractors, which employs other returning citizens. Uh, Marcus is also founder and CEO of FlickShop. You can see from his shirt there, from FlickShop, a <laughs> uh, mobile app that enables incarcerated people to receive mail and postcards from loved ones. He also founded the FlickShop School of Business, a program that teaches incarcerated youth life skills and entrepreneurship. Uh, he's been, his story has received a lot of coverage from CNN and the Washington Business Journal, among others. And last but not least is Alvaro Bedoya, founding executive director of the Center on Privacy and Technology at the Georgetown University Law Center, which focuses on privacy and surveillance law policy. Uh, prior to this uh, gig, he uh, was chief counsel to uh, Senator Al Franken, on the Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law. His expertise includes issues such as mobile location security, private data, pri uh, pi health data privacy, the drink is affecting me, sorry, uh, and improving protection for biometric technology. Before joining the Senate, he was an attorney, uh, an associate with Wilmer Cutler Pickering, and uh, also served as a research consistent, uh, consultant for the International Labor Organization's Special Action Program to Combat Forced Labor. If you could all uh, welcome everybody with a round of applause. So, Marcus, you have the shirt on. Uh, Flick Shop is something that you started. Um, you own a successful business here. For those of you, who, us who don't know your story very, very well, tell us how Flick Shop started. Tell us a little bit about the background and what Flick Shop specifically focuses on uh, in terms of formerly incarcerated people. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for allowing me to be able to be up here with you. It's amazing, um, amazing people. Um, so Flick, uh, I launched Flick Shop in 2012. Uh, uh, I launched Flick Shop because back in, in, not back in 1996, when I was first arrested, I was 15 years old. I was 15 years old and I got sentenced to um, a sentence that made me serve eight years in adult prisons in, um, uh, as a teenager. Um, in maximum security facilities. And so, you know, after celebrating your 16th birthday, your 17th birthday, your 18th birthday, your 19th birthday, all of that, um, it, it, it allows you to be able to look at life through a different lens every time you have a, a, a piece of human contact while you're behind those bars. And so, uh, my mom and my family, they wrote me, they sent me pictures over and over, and fast forward to, you know, several years later, now I'm on this side of the fence and I'm building technologies to be able to help those families um, I can look back now and see how important those letters and those pictures were for me, uh, you know, leading up to my release. So with FlickShop, what we do at FlickShop, we allow our customers to be able to take photos, um, add a quick message, press send, and we send this photo and message on a real tangible photo postcard to any person in any prison anywhere in the country. Um, with the thinking, uh, with, with us knowing how we engage and interact with one another um, using the social media, uh, in email and texting and all of that, they don't have that in prison. And when I was in prison during the Polaroid era, you know, um, it was easy to, you know, print photos because you would take it in to come out, you, you know, write a quick letter, you paid your bill, so you would write the letter and, you know, you would, you know, slip that envelope along with the stamps from your bills into the mail and it would get to me, but now we do everything online. And so because of that communication that we all have here, millions of family members don't have that kind of communication back there. So we built a conduit in that side of that technology. So 
So now, you know, we're happy to say that uh, we shipped well over uh, a quarter of a million photos since our, our launch to be able to connect that many families. And it's really, really cool to be able to, uh, to, be, able to be the the founder of such an amazing organization. And this is the part of the time, if any of you guys want to, I always you know, put the disclaimer out there, if, you want, if I see you looking down at your phone, I'm assuming that you're downloading Flickshop, <laughs> or leaving a review in your app store, well, none of us are mad at you. <laughs> so Teresa, you have a similar but different story. Um, you started a career, successful, professional. Uh, you were convicted of a crime, was incarcerated, and now you're uh, back on the outside with another successful venture, business venture. Tell us how how that journey went, um, and then also some of the kind of the similarities and differences of people in terms of who come out of uh, prison and some of the challenges that uh, not only you may have experienced, but also people that you interact with may have experienced. First again, thank you for allowing me to be here to share as well. Um, I went to prison when I was 44, so very different than going when you're 15. Um, I had a career, a family, as a matter of fact. I, my daughter was graduating from college on a Saturday, and my trial was starting on that Tuesday. So I had an opportunity to kind of have a life prior to incarceration. And I also had built up good skill sets. But I also knew that a prison sentence could lead to a lifetime lock out of employment opportunities. So I also knew I had to reinvent myself while I was in prison. I was an entrepreneur, um, a social entrepreneur, and so going to prison, sitting with 1,100 women in prison, I had a captive audience, and so I began asking questions. Who are you? You know, what is it like? And when I saw women leave prison and come back, I was really even more intrigued. I was intrigued because I knew prison life was no way of living, and there had to be some type of a disconnect from coming, from leaving prison to coming back. And what I learned was most people just had a hard time reconnecting back to their communities. It's very challenging to leave your family for a number of years and to come home and to have that. But it's even more challenging when you are unable to secure employment. You're unable to take care of yourself. And where you feel like you have good intentions, but doors are being closed. And so I listened to all of those stories and as I was rebuilding it, um, my own career while I was in prison, I began thinking of what will people need? Other people like me, male and female, when they come home. And for me, entrepreneurship had served as that path and I knew that I could create my own opportunity. Again, going to prison at 44 had capacity to do that. But I knew also that a lot of people who I served time with, that they didn't. And so I was interested in creating solutions that could go across the board and help other people as well. So what did you create? Well, the first thing we did was mission launch. And um, I have an entrepreneurial background. And my daughter, uh, while I was away, she was earning a master's of science and in information system. So we bridged those two skill sets together. And so it was, how can we create technology, open source, and help service providers? What we discovered was, not only is um, Reentry inefficient because technology isn't used by people who are behind the fence. Many service providers were still using paper and pencil and were giving people lists like, okay, go to this place, you know, and only for someone to get there to find out that place doesn't exist. And we weren't connecting people the right way. So we just started hosting hackathons, design thinking days, bringing service providers and bringing the civic coding community in. And we asked, would you build technology? if we all agree to use it? And the answer was yes. And so that's kind of the work that we started off doing. Um, I've now since uh, started an app myself around uh, technology, uh, an app around workforce. Because, and the real quick short story is, we were hiring people with convictions and we had a very unique opportunity. And the opportunity we had, it was gonna cost about $30,000. There was an individual who had a conviction who we were sure if he was ready for that opportunity. And in that moment, we realized that employers need a tool to help assess the risk and readiness for certain opportunities. And you can't rely just on background checks alone because background checks take a piece of data, this person has a conviction, freeze that person in time, 20 years, 30 years later, they're still answering for that. And so we bring lots of data in to frame who this person is 
Yes, it talks about there was a crime, but then what is their capacity? What have they been doing since? And so the tool is called R3 Score, and it's Risk Readiness and Reward. And we're hoping to be able to launch that a little bit later this year. So let's talk about that in just one second. But I want to take a step back. And it's, I'm glad you mentioned technology, because technology can be something that, um, that opens doors and creates solutions. Uh, misuse of technology or poor use of technology can be things that shut stores. So turning to both uh, Alvaro and to Arthur, um, this area of criminal background checks and the idea of um, you know, how to ensure, if you will, whether or not somebody, or to at least promote how somebody can be more successful. There's a lot of systemic issues that come along with the issue of criminal records. So Alvaro, if you could start by talking about some of the yeah. things that you've looked at, then I'll turn to Arthur too. Sure, so there's two issues that folks should be aware of with these background checks, because they're not really what they see. Um, a lot of times an employer will say, oh, well, we're hiring you, we're going to get your fingerprints, we're going to run a background check, it's just standard procedure. Um, and they'll take the fingerprints, they'll submit them to the FBI, which is the repository of these fingerprints, and there'll be a check. Um, but what you don't know is that half of the, uh, the entries into the national FBI fingerprint database don't actually have information on the final disposition of the case. Okay, so someone was arrested, right? They won't say, were they convicted? Were they found innocent? Were they never even charged? Or were they charged and then have the charges dropped? So um, the databases that supposedly provide you information about you know, the person's background only have half the story. Um, and it gets worse. Uh, why does it get worse? Well, um, in the 1970s, we passed uh, the Privacy Act, the Privacy Act of 1974. It gave people certain rights to data held by the government about them. And uh, if you read it quickly, it seems like a really great law. You know, you get to see what the, the government knows about you. You get to correct it. If, it. if there's mistakes, you get to know who it's been shared with. But littered throughout the law and added to that law over the course of many years are lots of exceptions. And you can bet that one of the exceptions is for law enforcement. And so these records that are held for employment background checks are maintained in law enforcement systems that are exempt from all these rules of the Privacy Act that make sure, that give you the right to know, okay, what does the government know about me? Is that information accurate? And if it's not accurate, how do I correct it? And so this whole infrastructure of fingerprinting is actually exempt from all these rules. The FBI says they have an alternate system that addresses these requirements, but it's, it's kind of a shadow of a system. What do I mean by that? So let's say you do have a record, right? You were arrested and you convicted of X, all right? Um, you, but you want to make sure, you know, you keep on getting dinged because it was a fairly minor thing. Let's say it was, a, it was a, 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 just a very, a, 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 you know, a misdemeanor offense. You were convicted of okay? So um, if you go, you actually uh, uh, do not have a right under the Privacy Act to access that information. You have to use the FBI's alternative system. And let's say you find out, you find the record, and it doesn't say you were arrested and convicted of X. It says you were arrested and convicted of Y which is a much more serious crime, all right? Then the question is, how the heck do I get this fixed? And the answer is not, you ask the FBI to fix it. Because what the FBI will tell you is that, well, that's not an FBI record, that's a state record. It's on the state to fix it. And so, you know, if you submit a, 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 a fixed request to us, a correction request to us, we're not gonna deal with it, we're just gonna forward it to a state. Okay, so this is a system maintained used and operated by FBI. But when, when it comes to the accuracy of that system, too often the FBI washes its hand of that problem. Uh, and so not only do you have folks who are factually innocent, right, who are arrested, never charged, had charges dropped, uh, being dinged by these background check systems, you have folks who might end up in these systems, yes, who committed an offense, were convicted of that offense, but have wrong information in the system. Uh, uh, who have really a really difficult time fixing it and addressing it. So these background checks in a law enforcement uh, 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 setting are not doing people good. Uh, uh, instead, we need to have a different system uh, and, and one that doesn't suffer from these problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Arthur, in I mean, you were a former prosecutor, uh, read a ton of rap sheets. Uh, I, read, I've read, I, was a, I was a former prosecutor as well. 
read rap sheets and saw like when you see arrest, arrest, and then you see a disposition, sometimes the case is that all of those arrests and, and charges may have been all pled or convicted under one conviction, but it doesn't clean up everything else that says this has been you know, disposed of by this. So if somebody who's an employer or somebody who's not involved in the, the kind of the criminal justice process sees that, all you see is arrest, 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 and then you see kind of a conviction, you don't see necessarily dismissal, dismissal that's attached to it. So it, it has a, uh, it could have an inaccurate portrayal of a person. What are some of the things that, you know, other things of why R Street kind of, and you in particular, went into this area specifically of criminal background checks, technology, and, and employment? <coughs> sure. I mean, let, me, let me shake your tree a little bit first. You know, we talked about the 5%, 70%. No, <laughs> but, Let's put those numbers in perspective when it comes to employment and, and the, the idea of lowering the crime rates through what I call the dignity of work. Uh, what many, well, actually, what the Catholic Church has coined. I thought I coined that phrase, then I found out. About it. We'll, 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 we'll put it on we'll, Wikipedia. going to say you did it. That's what happens when a Jew starts to quote Catholicism. But one out of three individuals, one out of three people, maybe not in this room, will have a criminal history record in the United States. One out of three. So if you take those numbers and you start looking at what that means to our criminal justice system, it starts becoming very profound. Let me take one tiny little uh, statistic for you and, and put it into play. If you go to jail pre-trial, you are innocent until you are proven guilty in the United States of America. If you go to jail and you stay in jail for more than 24 hours, the chance of you committing new crimes skyrocket. Now, that number is not as simple as because jail makes you a worse person, because I don't think that's entirely true, and I think it doesn't count, uh, doesn't take into play the socioeconomic backgrounds. But if you were in jail for seven days, you have a 70% chance, a uh, higher chance of committing new crimes. If it's only three days, you have a 40% chance of committing new crimes. Now, I know it's not uh, just jail makes you harder, I, because but I also know there's something about jail that, that, that it entices people and changes people. And I think it's because you lose your job. And I think when you lose your job, and I, I, I've been out of work. Anybody here been out of work? It is horrifying. It takes something from you. It takes your dignity. It, takes, it, ta it, it makes you afraid. And I think fear is what is the driving factor here. Because if you take this, these are low-risk individuals, so we can, we can argue about what a low-risk individual is. But usually low-risk is ties to community, not a very, uh, no substantial criminal history record. But if you look at high-risk individuals, there is no change for how long they stay in jail. High-risk individuals, because the, the, the crime they committed or they had numerous convictions. <coughs> I think it's something that's also very important about the FBI background check is look at what the, the database was invented for. Right. It was invented <coughs> Excuse me. It was invented um, as an investigative tool, and it is a great investigative tool. So you know, uh, Jesse, I'm sorry to, to pick on you, but if you're in a car with Miss Moss, and you guys are in a car together, and a cop pulls you over, and he feels like something is not right, but he can't prove it. He doesn't have probable cause, but he did, feels in his gut. That's good policing. Gut feelings are good policing as long as they don't uh, uh, cross the line and. In, and violate your constitutional rights. But if he feels something's not right, but he can't prove it, he might write what's called a contact card. Well, that contact card that says, Jesse, in the car with Miss Moss, something smelled wrong, don't know what it is, files it. That goes into a, a state database. Sometimes it goes all the way up to the FBI database. Now, Jesse, if you end up dead a week later, they have pretty good, they might go talk to Sasha Moss. What, why is, you were in a call with her. That's good policing. Now, there might be some privacy issues that you freak out about. That's okay. But, <laughs> but that is good policing, and that is what the FBI background check was designed to do. Good policing. And good policing does not mean have a system that's 50% wrong end up as a, serving as a vetting, a, a vetting source for employment. So to kind of an, the, 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 the fold the page on your, on your question, uh, we know that recidivism, the number one way to lower recidivism is through employment. So what this coalition wants to do and what I want to do and what our street wants to do is 
uh, tag that statistic and, and help people get a job um, because we know that lowers crime. So in terms of, in terms of the employer, right, and you all are employers, <coughs> um, whether or not you have your own company, or but you've done hiring. A lot of people in this room have done hiring. And so there are different types of mechanisms and procedures. There are different types of worries and concerns that everybody who hires somebody considers. Top of all, at the very top, can this person work? Is this person qualified? But the issue of qualifications is one of the areas where the whole criminal background uh, check, whether or not you have a criminal history, comes into play. So let's talk a little bit more of your each of your all's role as an employer or somebody who hires. And uh, what are some of the things that you can help other employers consider uh, in terms of how to look at a candidate who may have a criminal record, or not even a candidate, a, a job application or a job opening where you may want to either proactively hire somebody who has a criminal record or at the very least open your applicant pool so that those people aren't excluded from that applicant pool. And so Teresa, I'll start with you. I mean, you talked about this um, this tool that you provide, this R3, I believe, and so uh, let's, start, let's start with you. Well, if I go backwards, I once um, ran a small HR department, and I was often tasked with the responsibility of dwindling the pool of applicants down to five or ten. And by virtue of that, we looked for every reason possible to dwindle it down. So unless I had a directive that said, we're not looking for an individual, or we're open, and we're very intentional about hiring. Many HR professionals are just finding reasons to eliminate candidates. That's just kind of the nature of their job. Um, I applied for one job since I came home from prison and had a horrific experience and decided that it spoke to the dignity of work, that I did not have the ability to continue down that path. I was looking for a job, working from my home, using my computer, doing back office work, you know, one of those jobs is like make a little bit of money helping someone else. And I went through the application process online. I put in my very basic demographic stuff, my name, my address, and so forth. Right after that was the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime? I checked the box, yes, and the screen went black. And what came up next was something you answered disqualifies you for this opportunity. To something. Yeah. yeah something. <laughs> well, I know it wasn't my name, my address, right. and you know, right. very basic stuff. But what it was saying was that I did not have the ability to work from my home using my computer and my resources to do back office work for someone. And so like, there has to be a better way. But in that moment, I'll never forget how I felt in that moment. I, and I made the conscious decision that I will never put myself in that position again. And so for me, I really kind of doubled down on my own capacity and ability to just build something for myself and build something for other people that would counteract you know, that. So Marcus, you specifically go out and hire or, or want to hire people who have been formerly incarcerated or have criminal records. That is, a, that is somewhat different than most companies in the United States, but one, what, why is that your mission? And then secondly, is there anything that other places can learn from your experience um, about how you hire or uh, your experience with people who are formerly incarcerated as employees? Um, so, so two part question, I'll unpackage it. Uh, the first one, yes, yeah, so absolutely. I mean, when applicants come into my office and um, we don't even have a checkbox for that, but um, I shouldn't, you know, you give me the idea to now do it just for fun. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I come to my office, you know, I get excited when I, you know, when, when you start telling me, you know, you know, you have a conviction. I'm like, oh, man, you should see how many felonies I have. <laughs> <laughs> it really changes the dynamic of the conversation um, from that point forward, you know, in, in, in our offices. And, and all of my, you know, in my, in my staff, um, they kind of began to 
uh, my, the, the higher the higher up in, in, my, in my staff, and this is for the construction business. So with Flick Shop, uh, Flick Shop is a startup, and you know we have a smaller staff than in our construction business. Where um, in our construction company, currently we have 18 um, employees, and then we have subcontractors as well. Um, and I didn't talk a lot about the construction business, but essentially just to give a little bit of background, uh, the the way that I was I was able to actually start a tech company is simply because. Um, I was blessed to be able to have another business that was able to generate enough revenue for me to start um, the tech business because uh, uh, I'll tell you, you know, it was <laughs> a little hard, a um, little bit, a lot of bit. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, um, so one of the things that happened in our offices, and maybe this may sprinkle into the, some of the uh, some of the, some of the guys here, or um, even to the, the, the longer tentacles that are going to go outside of this room, um, is what I noticed happening is the conversations began to change and the culture began to change internally simply because the conversation changed. Um, the conversation changed, you know, when I was able, you know, being strong enough to be able to say, hey, listen, I have three felonies on my, on, 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 somewhere listed somewhere in some database somewhere. Um, several. Yeah, several of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's horrible. I gotta yeah. talk about how we can solve that problem. <laughs> um, so, so I, I knew that they, I knew they were there. I, I was it enabled me to be able to have a conversation with the people who manage the actual employing and my I'm like, well, why are so why don't people hire people with felonies? What is the reason? What is the cases? What, so, what case have you heard of? Um, we talked about it briefly, right, um, just a few minutes ago. Name the case that you heard where something happened because you hired someone that had a conviction. Um, and then what happens is when you begin to humanize the story. Um, of a person that's been in prison, the conversation changed. I'm here today to help humanize the story for people to say, hey, listen, look, I, I have a carjack. Like, I don't have the non-violent felonies that you would hear about when you're talking about the pardons going on in D.C. and all, every, every, all the other legislation that is surrounding non-violent crimes. I have a carjacking and a couple of other violent crimes. And yet I'm still here and I build businesses that are doing really, really well. How is it that we can reshape this and reshape the conversation here internally in the culture of perspectives, my construction business and now Flick Shop, so that we can again be able to reach out and find the tentacles inside of these rooms so that you guys can say, hey, I've met a guy who has a car jacket and maybe I might give him a job, I don't know. And how can that reshape the way that you know people do otherwise? So we take that conversation to you know uh, the South by Southwest and the the Aspen you know the, the Aspen Ideas Award, which um, I won Aspen Ideas Award last year. I'm doing a TED talk next week. I'm gonna be talking about that. But 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 that's I think the one of the biggest things for me in terms of I take it the personal mission of mine to one just change the conversation. You met someone now who has a violent crime. Do you feel do you still feel the same way? And we're, we're going to open this up. That's a rhetorical question. And we're going to open it up for questions and answer it afterwards. Feel free to that. You know, may not, may not have, we don't have to have it rhetorical. Um, but the, there are some other of these policies that have been um, talked about over the course of the last several years. And I think, you know, just stepping back a little bit, all these policies, they don't become real until you talk to somebody who is actually just as involved and how that applies to them. But because we're here in DC, uh, because we work at policy think tanks as well, I want to kind of open it up for others and talk about you know, other things. Like there's, there's a whole bunch of other potential pers um, solutions or at least things that may help, such as ban the box, right? Ban the box is a, uh, a policy that says, OK, you can cons a, an employer can't consider um, somebody's criminal record, but let's push it down towards the end or later on in the application process, in the hiring process, so that you do exactly what Marcus was talking about. You get to know the person a little bit, and you don't get that black screen on the computer that just automatically says, hey, for some unknown reason, you're no longer qualified. I mean, I, you know, Arthur Alvaro, what are I mean, some of these things like expungements or clean slate or, um, or band of box? Thoughts on those? Thoughts on whether or not they actually help or not? I'll start real quick, real briefly. Um, I didn't finish answering the last question. I just realized when you were talking, why is our street involved in this? Our street's a libertarian conservative organization. And I believe that the seed of conservatism and the seed of libertarianism is a limited government. And we know that certain people are treated uh, arbitrarily and capricious within the system. And if you're arbitrary and capricious, you're not a limited government by definition. And so if you have a, a criminal history record and you do 
go back, if you're unemployed and you go and you get picked up for a new crime, not, I don't want to talk about the, the, the well, I'll talk to you afterwards, but I don't want to talk about the merits of that new crime. But you have a higher chance of being convicted, you have a higher chance of getting a, high, uh, 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 getting a, a higher sentence, and you will serve more time in pretrial than if you are employed. So this is not a, just a question of whether or not people should have the opportunities. It is actually you're treated worse if you don't. It's like the self-licking ice cream cone and you're constantly <laughs> wrapped up in a system. And I do not believe there's old white people sitting behind a black, you know, in a dark room saying, how can we screw over people of color and poor people? I don't think that happens. But I do think the system the way it's designed has that effect. And that is still arbitrary and capricious. So I don't believe that, uh, uh, I believe Band of Box is a fine policy for the government. I would never endorse something like that for private organizations. A private organizations can hire who they want. Now, I'll give you an example. Uber wants to hire more people with criminal history records, and they can't. Why? Because the government keeps telling them they can't. The government should stay out of this. And the government should let the free market. Now, I know people are looking at me like, whoa, whoa. I know Bill's like, just want to throw something at me right now. But the free market, the free market will take care of most of this. And I really believe that. I know that this, you know, I am a libertarian. I don't want to sell heroin in a vending machine. But I do believe <laughs> the free market will provide most of the answers. And getting, it's not a situation of, raising the Uber and Lyft uh, standard to taxis, it's lowering the taxi standards. That's the answer, that's the solution. So I just want to caveat, virtually everything that we've talked about, we have a lot of thoughts. Put that out there. Alfred, thoughts on this? I actually want to ask you, Arthur, can you talk sure. a little more about why the government's not Uber, they can't do that? Well, in, in most states, the government, well, the state Massachusetts, you know, Massachusetts, they, they have these policies on what the threshold is for driving for a ride-sharing organization. And it's, it, this is a long conversation, because every 50 states got it, got it, got it. So Austin is a perfect example. Yep. I mean, boom, in one day, in one day, people lost their job. People right. lost the way that, not everybody provides for their family on Uber and Lyft incomes, but enough do, and some people are just making ends meet. They're just, they're just making it. And so when the, when the, when the government, and I'm not, I don't think they're doing this out of, well, I do actually think some uh, states have passed laws in an effort to protect the taxi industry. But I think most of the time they're trying to be, they're trying to provide security. It just doesn't provide security, especially with the FBI, what you just went over with the FBI background. It doesn't make it safer. Right. So, so it's states and localities saying, you can't drive if you have a criminal record. Yes. Or like that. Um, and I think it's a lot of states and localities do it to protect the taxi, Absolutely. The taxi industry. Um, um, so frankly, uh, uh, I would say, so one word on expungements and one word on um, what folks can do in this room. Um, and Alvaro, real quickly, yeah. if you can also, yeah. if there's anything that will scare the shit out of the rest of us about technology <laughs> out I work there. in surveillance, man. Yeah, there's please a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, we'll say that for the Q&A, but really quickly, um, expungements are extraordinarily difficult. You know. Um, so I think what Ed is hinting at is this, uh, um, we issued this report on how police use face recognition technology. Yeah. So um, half of all American adults, just by virtue of having a driver's license, are in a criminal face recognition network that's searched thousands of times a year without warrants, without code oversight, without reasonable suspicion. Um, and people have no idea. Uh, but as part of this, uh, uh, as part of this report, uh, we met a young woman in, uh, um, in, uh, uh, in Florida, Pinellas County, Florida. Uh, she'd been arrested for peaceful civil disobedience. Uh, they did a protest at a state fair. She was arrested for trespass. Um, first time, you know, she was like a classics and history major, like uh, um, had, no, had no contact with the criminal justice system. And so they didn't, they didn't bring charges. They just let her do, you know, five days of community service, if that, and then it was fine. Um, but, um, but now she has a criminal record, not just in Florida, but also with the FBI. And so um, we've been trying to help her figure out how to expunge. And, um, and it's this like packet that you need in a, a locally barred attorney to fill out. And, uh, and then there's a filing fee. Um, and then we realize that if we get Florida to expunge the record, you know, does Florida 
periodically update the FBI, like, hey, we expunged these guys' records. I, you know, I would, I would be a little skeptical about, about how, if and when and how that happens. And so then there was going to be a separate process of expunging from FBI. Uh, um, so it's just a mess. And so I don't think expungement is, look, if, 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 if you can do it, you have a lawyer, great. But I don't think it's expungement is an answer. Um, frankly, I think right here, uh, uh, and, um, and I'm glad to be uh, at an R Street event, because uh, I think one of the best overseers of the federal government, uh, um, with a few exceptions, I, uh, uh, but when it comes to law enforcement, uh, uh, is Jason Chavins. Uh, uh, and uh, um, his work on, uh, on oversight of federal law enforcement systems is absolutely terrific. Uh, and at the Oversight Committee, um, it is just a powerful group of Republicans and Democrats uh, that, um, that are really uh, uh, asking hard questions about how the federal government runs a lot of these systems that are, you know, millions of taxpayer dollars go into, millions upon millions of millions, and are basically subject to a little oversight. So if one thing you can do here in D.C. is encourage the work of that committee with respect to law enforcement systems, uh, I think that would be terrific. Um.